My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows and for links to previous shows. Today, my guest is Lou Jones. Lou is a commercial photographer based in Boston, Massachusetts. He's been on the show previously to talk about photographing the Olympic Games, but today I've asked him back to talk about a project he's been working on called the Pan-Africa Project. It's creating a contemporary visual portrait of modern Africa. So please welcome Lou Jones. Got to unmute, Lou. There you go. I'll, I'll say my thank yous again. Thank you. <laughs> the opportunity to talk both to your audience and to talk in general about uh, this this uh, this this long term long long term project uh, is uh, is a, a, a tremendous honor. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of show people what uh, I'm gonna share screen. Wait a minute, I've, I've got to figure out how to do that. <laughs> Give me a half a tick. We tested this, so I, hopefully this will work. Can everybody see that screen now? It seems to be, there it is, yep. Okay, all right. So, um, as John has mentioned, and as I suspect a number of you are interested in the fact that I am a commercial photographer. The studio behind me, the studio over there, this is the office where my employees work, et cetera, et cetera, do primarily commercial advertising uh, and corporate work. And that's what has sustained me for longer than most of you have been alive. Um, so I have been working at that, but also we have been in parallel with my commercial work. The studio has always, almost always been involved in some kind of documentary we are starting to call them long-term projects because they often take weeks months and years to do some of which are things like the olympics as we did for john a few weeks ago i have photographed 13 olympic games unfortunately i missed this past one because of a pullout by my client uh, not at the last minute they once it was canceled last year, they got very dicey and et cetera. And I was very ill not be able to go this year, but I've done 13. That's a long-term project. There is an exhibit. I was able to convince a gallery to reopen and there is an exhibit of the Olympic work in Cambridge up and we had a big opening, live opening, et cetera. Uh, other kinds of projects we've been involved in are pregnancy. I've been photographing pregnant women for years. And we did a project, a long, a very long-term project that resulted in a couple of books and many, many exhibitions, one of which is also at a major museum on, on the death penalty. So we photographed 27 men and women uh, on death rows all over the United States. And uh, that uh, has been come, become, but that took many years uh, to do. After that, I was kicking around the projects I do. I like to think of them being non derivative, as meaning that I'm not using anything I've seen someone else do. And I think we've been fairly good about that. And in, and in this particular case, um, I had a very, very strange reaction, maybe almost 20 years ago, to uh, many of the negative, actually it was a newspaper article in New York Times that said, uh, that the African Union was going to censor Western media's access to news stories in Africa because of the tr terrible, terrible, terrible approach that they take to the news. Now, this was, this was horrific at the time when I read this, a bit of censor, censorship. We'd grown up in our schools to think of censorship as being a negative thing. And then when I read further and then I thought about it, I realized 
that they were probably right. That Western media, and this is something I've only learned since I have been doing this project, but Western media really has a neo-colonial attitude toward Africa, having been largely dismissed from most countries in Africa and Africa trying to take back their own resources and cultures and et, et cetera, and has dismissed a lot of the Western, not entirely of course, but that they're still using the media, education, politics to paint a negative picture. They only talk about poverty, pestilence and conflict on the front pages of our newspapers. And having been there, I was very, very uh, uh, taken aback. It took me many, 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 many years, but I started to design a way of using my profession, my photography, to dispel a lot of the misconceptions about Africa. So we've been visiting. And so the, the elevator speech is, that we're the mission statement, the elevator speech is that we're trying to photograph all 54 countries in Africa and do something with them, with the idea that we're interested in modern, contemporary, active Africa. Uh, and so here is the website. I'm gonna do this a little differently than I normally do, a little differently than I did before, but I'm gonna use my, the website of, that we have created. And I think you'll, as photographers and, and, and creators yourself, you'll see why in a minute. So we're dealing with, we have to date, we have visited 14 countries. Um, we have lost a tremendous amount of momentum. And I was just talking to Raul, uh, who's down in South Africa and looking in from South Africa. We've lost some momentum, but we're trying to restore that momentum. Now, um, you see here, you know, a big, a big um, map. The website is not designed for photographers. Even though it is photographically driven, it is about my profession of being able to go and tell stories using photography. It is not designed. It's designed with a much broader image of people coming who are interested in Africa for reasons that very often we don't have any idea what they're looking for. It could be education. It could be a 12th grader looking to do a paper on Africa and maybe wanting to include some imagery and things like that. So you see here, this map uh, has been created. Let's see if I can move it a little bit to the center. And uh, these are the countries we've been to. You see where we've been uh, and you see where we're going. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, there are 14 countries we have photographed and we spend a, an appreciable amount of time in each country, we go one at a time uh, and spend a lot of time. And so uh, I'm gonna go down and show you what kinds of things we've been. So again, we're looking for contemporary, we're looking for contemporary industry education, um, uh, sports, very important component, uh, uh, foodstuffs, agriculture, and things like that. Our educational system, our politicians, our newspapers, TV, our parents treat Africa as if it's a monolith, it's one, oh, people will say, I went, oh, you went to Africa, which is like, oh, you went to Asia? 
you, you know, it's, there are 54 countries. It's got the most countries of any continent. So we're trying to deal with the unique nature. So there's languages. How do you photograph language? Um, how do you see the interaction with people? How do you see the difficulties of having multiple languages or all things? We're dealing with resources. This is the Nile, the Egypt, one of the largest rivers and how that has affected them. the unique countries that border the Nile and how, how historically, but more importantly, how contemporarily um, they have dealt with it. So we, we're dealing with, you see, you know, education, dealing with religion and uh, commerce, how people make a living, how people function inside of uh, each individual country. And as you go from place to place, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we proceed, but here's an outside market and it's in, in, in Ghana. And you see how people are communicating, how people are buying, what they're, what they're doing, things like that. And we talk about the economies. One of the misconceptions of Africa is how vibrant some of the economies are. You know, as I said, one of the things we talk about only in Western media is the poverty, the e economy being negative, how people are starving. All of these things are true, but also we're seeing some tremendous efforts. And we're gonna talk a little bit about, about that. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the top. So how long has this project been going? When did you get started? I got started um, 2013. Mm -hmm. And we have not been there in almost, we've, we have not been there since just before COVID uh, started. So that's, that's running up on two years. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're getting this, this loss of momentum. And at my age, that's not, that's not a small thing. So we're getting very, very anxious about, uh, okay, I'm going to go to the, to the map. So one of the things that we deal with is that we had a software developer at great expense, but they were, you know, and of course they had, they, they deal with the world, with the world and maps of the world, which very sophisticated work they've been doing. But of course, Africa was the least sophisticated. And so we had to approach them and see if they couldn't uh, do something here. I'm going to bring this up the major map, the one that we use for uh, communication. And you can see how they've given us sort of uh, ways to deal with so that somebody who might be being transferred by his company, his or her company to Africa, who might not know much about the region will go on and of course, go on to Google and start to look up. We're hoping that one of the destinations is, and so you can see how we've uh, allowed people, this is the places we've been and uh, the gray ones are the ones that we still have left, but let's go, let's try and see how we deal with it. So a person can go and if they're interested in say Morocco, this is a, each page, each country that we have been to has its own page and we deal with it, each one of them uniquely. So we deal with the boots on the ground, us being there, us photographing means that we're traveling an awful lot in the time that we spend. We're there for at least a month uh, we're working on the next country we're talking about maybe as much as six weeks. Uh, it is very difficult to cover a country in that short a period of time, and especially with the broad spectrum. But we go, you know, here's Rabat, this is the capital. Uh, uh, 
Uh, we're dealing with uh, religions. Uh, you've seen this picture before, but we're dealing with uh, uh, how, do you, how do you picture, how do you photograph languages and how do people use them? The Arabic, so you're getting the Arabic and the Berber and the French, which are the main, main uh, languages. Um, and we deal with, again, the economies, very, very important. Morocco considers itself to be Africa light, L-I-T-E, because they're so close to Europe. So their, their ideas of how they interact with the world, with, with Africa itself and with the rest of the world is very, very unique. As, so, and then there's a compendium. And this is where we're hoping that people really start to look and that you who are looking in. So we're, we're going in and we're doing things like, let's see, we're showing what the city is. Years ago, getting ready to go to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, I pulled it up on Google and the photographs, just the city, the photographs were atrocious atrocious. So you see this neo-colonial negativity that Western media is, is trying to impart to the rest of the world. So here's, 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 here's this, is, this is Casablanca, you know, very modern. We're in one of the tallest buildings there. And this is something we do. We make a point of trying to get these sort of, we've been doing this for years and years, long before, but we go into, let's see, let's see. We're going into hospitals, uh, small clinics, uh, doctor's offices, all kinds of situations. This is a major, major uh, hospital that they, I look just like the surgeons here, captain gowned and they, they, were, they were delighted to show me, I was able to look into this, person's chest and see the heart beating. Uh, and they, they, were, they thought it was very funny, the fact that uh, I didn't faint and stuff like that. But I've done a lot of this kind of work. So I've sort of gotten in, uh, used to it. But we go into, this is a, go into schools. The education of, is, is a political issue in many of the countries. So some countries are doing tremendous work to, this is uh, one of the universities in Morocco and it is, uh, this is actually the science, one of the science departments and things like that to show uh, comparable. Uh, but then we get into here, here's a, into a much more, uh, as I said, we travel a lot. So we're on the road use every kind of conveyance you can imagine. We, we're, a lot of it's riding around uh, and, and, and stopping whenever I see something, but also in order to get long distances. And this is way up in the Atlas Mountains. Um, and this is a, in a Medina, uh, an ancient, ancient, hundreds of years old. This family's been in this Medina for, for, uh, for, for generations and things like that. But uh, getting access and being able to photograph in these places is... How many people are you traveling with? The first trip, I will talk about that in a minute, but the first trip okay. I went by myself, which I'll never do again. I didn't, I didn't know if it was possible to do this with mm -hmm. the first one. So I, was, I, I didn't want to spend an enormous... I wanted to see if it was possible. So I'm usually traveling with at least one assistant and I have been with as many as three. So uh, now, uh, to clarify on that, very often the other one or two people that I'm, I'm traveling with that are coming from the United States with me, that work in the studio or, or, or et cetera, are also supplemented with often a translator fixer mm -hmm and or a driver. Sometimes the translator fixer is this also the driver, which is where, where it really works well when the uh, yeah. person is okay. But 
sometimes that's not always uh, 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 possible. So the so I think in I think in Ethiopia we at one point had five people that we were creating around, but that's that's that gets starts to get a little bit uh, too big. So I like I like three four people no more than and uh, one assistant I can work with. And I've done that a few times, but uh, uh, but we're carrying a lot of equipment also. That's, that's yeah. one of the big problems. Okay, so all right, um, let's see where we can go. We are, industry becomes an incredibly important component. And we have found being slapped up against the back of my head by local people. I'm gonna talk about that in the next country about, about the use of these resource, of these wonderful people who give, but we're looking at doing industry, but industry does not mean the same thing it's not just a different word, it's a different concept. So, um, but this is the oil refinery uh, in, in Morocco, Northern Morocco. Uh, and, uh, and it's a kind of thing that they make a lot of their gross national product. And, and it's very important for us to chase these kinds of photographs down and to actually get into these plants and things like that. So, uh, and then, we try to make sure that people are seeing the cutting edge technologies that are happening in Africa, which are extremely sophisticated in many of the countries, but also in say in a photograph like this, where you're getting not only say solar power, which is what I was chasing, but also you're getting this more traditional way of this, this shepherd uh, uh, tending his sheep. So you're putting these photographs using photography. We don't need translators. Photographs, us as photographers have the universal language. So we can show people exactly what these people look like. We can show people how they live. This is a tremendous, tremendous, uh, uh, a tool. And um, so we're able to, now I'm going to go back up, go back up and go to another country, see if I can find another place. People know, most of you know Morocco. Let's see if we can uh, maybe go here, here. This is Ghana. And you asked the question about, this was, this one, let's start over. I got off a plane in the airport of Accra, the capital of Ghana, in 2013 by myself with a bag of cameras, lenses, a bag of speed lights, a bag of light stands and tripods and some clothes. So I was creating all this around by myself. Ghana was proof of concept. I was not sure whether the many years I had spent on figuring out how, how to do this, I rejected so many, many different approaches to doing this project. I reject, I've got a, a, a filing cabinet of, of throwaway because every time I got weeks into research, something would happen that would say that can't work. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that means as time goes on. So you see how this page about Ghana is constructed for somebody who might just come cursorily to the page, could care less about my photographs, could care less about Africa, but is interested maybe in something that's happening in Ghana. And so, they're, so we're trying to make sure that we treat each, um, we have designers, graphic designers design the pages, and we have uh, artists who are 
designing the maps. Maps I have found to be a tremendous asset. I even have somebody on my advisory board. That's all he does is Africa maps. He has an enormous collection of Africa maps. And so he is, uh, so we have these handmade or uh, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can specifically talk about certain issues. Uh, Are you going to talk case. about funding or how you're Yes, I will. This? Absolutely. I'm going to talk Great. about funding. Absolutely. Um, uh, natural resources. Some of the most interesting, you know, things. This, this is Lake Volta. It is the largest man-made lake in the world. And how these three or four countries that are around Lake Volta utilize the resources of water for drinking, for cooking, for commerce, for fishing, for uh, uh, irrigation, et cetera, et cetera, is, and so the villages and towns around Lake Volta, and that was put in many years ago, but we talk about cultural things, music, how incredible Africa is about its music. And then I'm gonna go down here, see where can we, here, here, here's the, so finding these unique little things where this is a, a, a school, talk about education, that was teaching just women how to fly these uh, light aircraft, uh, because so much of the, these countries, some of these countries is inaccessible without a lot of time spent. The roads are difficult. They're not many roads. They're remote areas. So these people are being taught, these women are being taught to fly these so that they can bring in emergency medicines in case that's necessary. They can uh, bring in mail, they can bring in uh, supplies if there's a certain situation. So they're being taught. So we found, so these are the kinds of progressions. These are the kinds of ways that these individual countries are adapting to the environment that they're living in and how they are in modern times, using the resources that they have to deal with their situation. The Western world is trying to push a lot of stuff onto them that is not always working. And so seeing in the last several decades, them approach this in such unique ways. So we see, oh, here's, here, here's a photograph here. Uh, I'm gonna show you. Uh, so we're going into media. We're dealing with the TV, how TV is being used. Um, uh, we, we, we went to a festival a couple of years ago in Burkina Faso, this largest African film festival where TV shows uh, and, 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 and dealt with it. People come from all over Africa, movies. They make movies, TV series, etc. But this is Ghana, and I found out this is what the learning process is that the media's radio, TV, social media, um, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, newspapers are alive and well in Africa because they use these resources. This is a, a radio station and they're getting news, music. Uh, it was very odd to get so much American sort of oldies in these places, oldies music, but uh, they're, they're doing these wonderful things. Let's see if I can go. Oh, I know where I wanted to go. Here, here, here. This is, this is one of the most amazing things I saw on my first trip. This goes on forever. I think it probably wraps two or three times around the earth. This, 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 this fishing industry is such a big part of the Southern part of Ghana and Southern part of West Africa. So you can see how people are 
They go out for days at a time to fish. They bring the fish in. You see the crowds in the background where they're, they're uh, brokering the fish, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I came over the hill and saw this and was just blown away. This is actually uh, one of the photographs that's been exhibited quite, I, I, I exhibit this. A lot of schools want to see this material. So, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna go up here, religion. And being culturally sensitive to, uh, I don't know if any of you know Chester Higgins, but he did a Zoom talk for ASMP yesterday, amazing. He talks about how he is, when he's photographing, he's like water. He's flowing around all the obstacles, flowing in and out, rather than being resistant and being demonstrative, he's moving around all the obstacles. And in cases of cultural things, some countries in Africa are relatively easy to photograph in. People like it. Others are very resistant. And you have to discover within hours, days, when once you land in the country as to what which where you are on that spectrum and then how to deal with that that is one of the biggest problems i have this is a religion and i had to go talk to the uh primary priest for quite a while in order to convince him to let me take pictures but once we got past that um uh, uh, i got wonderful wonderful images I'm going to go back up uh, and let's see if we can get to another country. We're going to talk a little bit like you said about uh, equipment maybe. And uh, let's see, where do we go? Oh, here, let's do, yes, let's do Namibia. Now we're all the way down in, uh, Raul, are you back on? Um, uh, we were talking, Raul is down in, down in South Africa. This is a country that is, uh, right next to South Africa, Namibia. Yeah, yeah, I was there, I was there a few months ago. Yes, uh, during COVID Fantastic, then? I love it. Yes, it's a wonderful country, isn't it? It's the most amazing country. I, I mean, it's just, yeah, I could go and live there. Yeah, they are, uh, it, this one fell into my lap in a funny kind of way because, uh, and we're gonna talk. So, so I, again, somebody created this map for us, we're talking about history. I was, a, I was long before I started this project, I was a vexillologist. I know hopefully most of you don't know that's a Jeopardy word. It's every now and then you see it on Jeopardy. It means the study, or study flags. So I can identify most flags around the world. So uh, this wow. is so I, 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 it's easy for me to make that part of the, uh, the process. But Namibia, as Raul can hopefully attest, has probably the highest dunes, sand dunes in the world. It's, they're enormous. Uh, that last, what was it, Mad Max? They filmed a lot of Mad Max in Namibia because they used the sand dunes and they used the, uh, the, 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 what do they call it? The uh, death coast. Uh, um, as the skeleton, the skeleton, skeleton coast. coast. Yes, as background, because it's so desolate and so isolating. But but they're gorgeous. People go and ski and snowboard on these sand dunes. They're really, and then we're right next to uh, the Kalahari. Um, uh, this was the, this was right at the. This is actually Kalahari. You see the the, the the car with the headlights. So we're right on the edge of the Kalahari Desert. But the deserts. And these juxtapositions are, but here's downtown, and this is considered, it has won the award for the cleanest city in Africa. Uh, it's called Windhoek. It's got a German name, but it's a, a tremendous, this is one of the clubs, inside one of the clubs. Um, uh, and then we see, let's see, let's go down here. Oh, here, 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 I wanted to show. We talked about media. Um, to tell a quick story, um, I'm very interested in the newspapers and the 
TV stations, etc. Uh, I was able to get permission to photograph at a new at the, the Nib Namibian, as you see on the newspaper. And the managing editor was not all that happy about having me come in and photograph his people. But I convinced him to let me. I said, isn't there something a little more dynamic? Like, where do you print the paper? And he said, well, you only print it at midnight, 11 o'clock at night, they printing, they're printing. So I was able to get access. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about equipment because I take, as I said, the first time by myself, every time since, we take a bunch of speed lights. I wrote a book a few years ago on speed lights and most of my commercial work is done with speed lights. So we take eight, 10 speed lights halfway around the world, all around the world for, and this was shot with speed lights. The same with the picture of inside this, uh, uh, it's not a 737. I thought it was a 737 and somebody slapped my hand and told me it wasn't. So anyway, I, it took me the entire time I was in Namibia to get permission to photograph inside this airplane, but this is uh, Air Namibia. So we're doing these, but the currency, we're talking about funding a little bit. We'll get more, but the currency that we use is just photographs. So we were able to send the managing editor after I was editing that night, I sent him and several of these photographs ended up in their 60th anniversary issue. So we use pictures as a, as a way of paying people back because this project is astronomically expensive. Um, we stay where we land. And so this was a village up in the Northern part of Namibia and we uh, stayed in their dung, we make their huts out of dung and we ate with them and uh, we do a lot of that. So uh, this was a, a extremely important association. And then I'm going to talk, I am hope Raul won't, won't get mad at me, but I'm going to talk about an issue. This is, this is a ghetto. This is one of the townships right at the edge of Bindhook. Namibia was largely under the aegis of South Africa for many, many, many generations. Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, and the Germans were there. Is that right? The Germans had a tremendous, yeah, tremendous negative effect. And they created very similar to what South Africa, the townships in Namibia. And this is one of the townships that has now grown up. It's an enormously huge section just at the edge. And you can still see the differentiation between where the township was before apartheid and now and the primarily white section of the capital and you can see the line of separation just like that it's just amazing but they have grown up in commerce the schools etc so we did a lot of work in the uh in the sort of ghettos of uh of, of bent hook and then we have i'm going to show you one more and then we're going to go to another country and we're seeing how the youth, we're talking about sports, track and field, soccer, uh, boxing, all of those kinds of things we photograph, but also we're seeing a tremendous interest in not only these tr traditional games, but they're tremendously active with um, video games. They're really amazing. They're better than our kids here in the United States because uh, they've grown up with it. And so uh, let's go back and see. Okay, that was Namibia, let's see. Oh, I know, I know, I'm gonna get right right down there with you, Raul. I'm gonna go right here, get right in, in the, into the belly of the beast. Lesotho. Lesotho, this is, this is another Jeopardy question. The lowest, the lowest, landlocked country in the world is Lesotho, completely landlocked. By, and as a matter of fact, this first photograph that you see is me on a hill in the capital of Lesotho, Maseru, you see here. 
And in the background, the mountains there, that's South Africa. So uh, it's completely yeah. landlocked. It's way up high in the mountains. They have a ski resort. There's actually a ski resort. Is that right, Raul? I, I believe there is. I, I don't know how active it is. I don't know how well uh, supported it is. Yes. I've well, heard here's, about it. Here's the, you know about these, you know about the, what do you, they call them, the uh, herd boys, herd boys. The, the Basutu herd boys. Yes, <laughs> the herd boys. This is a very unique uh, culture where these kids grow up with their herds and they live with them the entire, almost their entire lives. And they, they care for these enormous herds of of sheep, goats, uh, cattle, et cetera, et cetera. And then we talked about medicine. I'm gonna get out of this and, and I'm gonna talk about more uh, um, uh, pertinent things that you guys may be in. But this is a, uh, what we would have called, it took us a long time to get permission to photograph this woman. She would have been called, it's, in, they, it's in Gaka is how, uh, I'm not saying it correctly. Nganga. What? Do that again. Nganga. Nganga. There you go. <laughs> Nga, no, it's not Ngaka. Okay. Ngaka. Ngaka. Thank you, thank you. And so you this. Gotta have click. You, you gotta have that click on the tongue. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the click click language is very very prevalent down in this part of Africa. So. Uh, but this is a we, we, we would have called and called a pejorative witch doctor. But their holistic medicines, their psychological approach to uh, caring for their uh, patients, using the quotes around it, their people is very. So we have tried to deal with contemporary modern medicine, the clinics, how they're brought to local regional places and all the way to the herbalist uh, and people who are practicing very often um, in, 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 in Namibia, people will go to her before they will go to modern medicine. And so uh, uh, I wanted to get one more. So you see the education here, you see all the kids in schools, uh, the herd boys here being educated, that's a big problem uh, where, where uh, the, the dams, because they're so high in the mountains, there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of water for irrigation. They actually sell, or they have in the past sold a lot of their water because there's so much of it. It rained all the time when I was there. Uh, so they have, they've dammed up and they're selling a lot of the uh, hydroelectric power and the water into South Africa. So South Africa is getting a lot of the, so that's one of the ways that they are making uh, some of their resources. This is uh, a woman making beer. And I, I didn't, I wasn't a big fan of the beer, but it was, it was pretty, it would do the trick, get you drunk. Um, but this woman, and this is done in the villages and you can see people are, this is a way of making that. Okay, let's go now. You asked about funding. I'm gonna go back to the top. I'm gonna go back to the top and show you. We have done two, we've raised money in many different ways, but the two most prevalent and that have gotten us the most amount of money has been uh, using uh, crowdfunding. And if anybody knows that social media, social media made this whole project. I can actually go to Africa and show you pictures of what we're taking, what we're seeing every day using social media. And we do, we communicate with the people who are supporting us, the people who are interested in Africa. We're showing them, showing you these kinds of pictures every day. So I'm able to go and often find Wi-Fi that's strong enough for me to send a number of pictures daily. Uh, so we're using social media to its, and social 
crowdfunding. So we used, we did two Kickstarters and we raised a lot of money for, and one of the things, the first one, we just sold portfolios and picture photographs and portfolios. The second one, we asked people, and I don't know that anybody else on, people have, a lot of people have paid for books, but we were asking people to pay for the book before it was published, before it was even photographed and to pay for future trips. But the book that is, uh, you probably can't see me, but the book right here, this is the book that you see there. Can everybody see that on the little pictures? I don't know if everybody can see the little pictures, but we published- It'll show up in the recording. Okay, all right. So we published the first, people kept saying, when are you gonna do the book? When are you gonna do the book? And I said, uh, when I finish this project, I'll be 107 and it'll be another several years. So, but I realized again, we're solving all kinds of very complex problems. Uh, and one of, them, one of them was people were asking for a book and we realized in the second, Kickstarter, one of the rewards was the book Sight Unseen. So a lot of people bought the book before it was published and everything like that. And, uh, 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 but I'm gonna talk about, that's how we have done much of the funding. Um, social media has extended my career tremendously being able to travel around the world and do projects and be able to communicate with people using social media to, to, to use the website to start with, to use Facebook and be able to show people. So once social media became mature and I could start to communicate with people as I'm doing the project, it became a lot more possible to make all this work how are we doing on time john we're just about uh less than an hour in and we can go as long as you need to go we can okay, go to 90 okay, minutes okay. or because i've got a lot more to talk about yeah <laughs> it's a yeah. big project of, of course most of you are going i uh, just shaking your head and say this is overwhelming this is impossible and like i said i got off a plane in ghana to see that was that was proof Ghana, the first place was proof of concept. Once I did it and realized I could get into these places, I could get people to, in Africa, the mission statement, the idea, they love it. Here we go, ah, it's Africa, who cares? Uh, why you know, I know everything I need to know about Africa. But in Africa, they realize that they need better PR. And so people are a lot more accepting of this crazy, overwhelming idea of making, giving voice to people who don't have voice often to making sure that the modern contemporary parts of Africa are being presented in a way in which our educational system, as a matter of fact, educational system, we talk about funding. We've been working with for several years now, and we finally got the Massachusetts Department of Education to pay attention to us. We've been hawking at them for several years, and they finally are using the website and are buying photographs for the 2022 curriculum for seventh grade using our photographs. So that's a way you talk about funding. So we're trying to say to educational systems and we're hoping that that leads to other educational systems to pay attention because the photographs that they use, that you've been, they've been using the same photographs when you were in grade school <laughs> last week in school. They're horrific photographs. And you know that there's beautiful photography of animals and tribal situations. I'm gonna to go to that right now. Uh, but to get, to, 
to show kids what it looks like in a phosphate plant, what it looks like in a home uh, of a, an accountant, of an architect in Africa, those pictures are tremendously lacking. And that's what we're trying to make sure that we're fulfilling. We are shooting the animals. We're shooting the tribes, which I'm gonna to go to next. We're doing all of that, but we are concentrating on contemporary everyday Africa. Now, I'm gonna actually go now to where I've been promising you. Okay, here's the, here's the main map. And you can go and see where we've been if you're interested in a particular place, but this is something we call it ethno. We, my advisory board slapped me around pretty good about using many different words we tried to call it, but we're calling it for, for now an ethnographic map. So we created this. This is completely, we went back to that same software that created the original map and we asked them to do something else for us. And they weren't so good. So we had to do a lot of this ourselves. So it may be uh, maybe not as sophisticated as, as some of those people, but we created an ethno. So we look at, look how we did this. We erased all of the colonial frontiers, the colonial borders, the colonial barriers between countries, which didn't exist 300, 400 years ago. The Europeans and America, I'm not gonna leave us out, but European made a situation where they cut the country, they divided the country up just because they were raping the different resources. We all know about gold and diamonds, and now we know about oil, and, 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 and up in Morocco, there's phosphate and, and uh, mag, mag, uh, manganese and all these other resources. Uh, agriculture, they're becoming one of the biggest, okay. They divided it up so that you got one for you, one for you, one for you, two for me, two for you, two. And that's what the lines of the different countries are. But at a time, they cut, they cut tribes in half. They didn't care. So I was not trying to make the ethnographic map. I didn't, I didn't see it. I, I'm, I'm, as, I'm as naive about this as anybody. Had a head start on Africa, but I'm learning so much because contemporary, the guys wearing ties and going to work with a briefcase and the women going to uh, offices and becoming stockbrokers, et cetera, et cetera, becoming politicians, all of that was contemporary and very active. But in point of fact, the tribal situation is so important in Africa. And we, as Westerners, see it as almost primitive. I'm, I'm really going out way out on a limb here. So bear with me a little bit. We often see, even though we have lots of photographers that are photographing people with the headdresses and the costumes and things like that, which is excruciatingly important work to preserve these these cultures that have been around for so long and have done such incredible things, but it's, a, it's an anomaly in, or at least was being seen. Whereas in point of fact, these two cultures, this modern culture and this tribal culture, this ethnic are being this indigenous culture as they call it are in parallel. These things are being preserved by the people who want and, 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 and it is such an important. So it is, has nothing to do with economics in most cases. It has to do with them trying to preserve this, these beautiful cultures with tremendous resistance from modern culture. So as we're photographing 
and going out to these remote, more remote places and photographing these people, we realized that we had a large body of work and that we should recreate, not recreate because I don't know that it ever, but we should create. So we started photographing and putting, this took us a long time. And again, we've had a lot of academics help us with this. One of the things was that a lot of these tribal situations flow over each other. And we were being very discreet, being Western stupid minds. We were making lines of demarcation. Whereas in point of fact, a lot of these things, so we had, to, so let's see. And so this is what we're doing with, so the Mosi and how long they've been in, in, in Western Africa. And the Mosi are mostly in Burkina Faso, but we were able to, we were able to photograph and we realized that we had these bodies of work. So we're, we, we went in and we, let's see. Uh, yeah, here. So we found these women's collect, these are Mosi and they're, they're women's collectors. So we're doing lots of women's issues because that's such a politically complex thing in Africa. Some places are dealing with it well, some are not, uh, but this is a collective. So these women got together and are making argon oil. Argon is, uh, is a thing of a fruit, something that grows in trees. And in, and in this part of the world, the, um, the goats, clump, goats actually climb the trees and eat the argon oil out of the trees. And then they are used in beauty products. So they're used in soaps and lotions and cosmetic yes, hair products. Hair care, there you go. Hair, hair care, care, Moroccan argon oil. Uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so not only is this picture significant and you see, see, see we've used a, uh, a light. There's a light on her. We, we brought a light in order. Uh, etc. And then there, we've got other collectors. This is a textile. In this part of the world, they make beautiful textiles. And so these women are joining together and are able to make these textiles, not only to produce them, but also to sell them and market them and distribute them. So um, that's a bit, that, was, that was sort of why we were here. But in point of fact, these are Mosi. And so we've included them. Let me go back up to another another so you can see maybe oh here 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 um we're going to go back to raul's area raul probably knows a lot about this more than i do but uh this is the himba this is in, in, primarily in namibia these people were almost extinguished by the germans there was a tremendous genocide that the germans killed and I think they apologized and, and offered to actually pay reparations recently. Uh, but I was not photographing them as a tribal situation, although we did go in and, and went into the, some of the villages. I was photographing them because we're seeing these contemporary in the center of Windhoek capital, we're seeing these people wearing contemporary clothing and these women who are, I thought, doing this, but this is the way they look. This is the way they have done this for centuries. And we see this. And so I went and chased down, uh, we, we've gotten a little bit of trouble with the educational systems because bare breasts are uh, not really all that appropriate. So you see how I photographed a lot of them from behind and stuff so that we can use them in the educational. But um, this is something you see every day in the middle of the cities. Uh, yeah. And then I'm gonna, go ahead, somebody ask a question. This is Ralph. Okay. No, I didn't ask any, I was, I was just nodding in agreement. Oh. <laughs> I've, I, I've seen them as well. Yes, yes, and here, right next to them. This is what's so unique. The, uh, the, the Germans also tried to kill off all the Herero too. They tried to subjugate them and uh, got a lot of resistance and then they eventually started to kill them. So we're seeing from people who are almost 
naked in their traditional to people who have been wearing these amazing costumes that are very Victorian based. And they wear these every day. You see them everywhere. Here's, here's a perfect example. So you're seeing these, these women and they grow up like this. So they're wearing these very elaborate and these, uh, uh, these headdresses illustrate the ownership primarily. I'm being very, very uh, simplistic here, but they, they often uh, uh, denote the ownership of cattle, which is a very, very um, important um, product. This is roadside, roadside food. Here we go. And I'm gonna to go to one more and let's see, here, here it is. Oh yes, 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 I do, I, one more, one more. Something maybe some of you have in fact, this is Maasai. Um, and this is a very large, very well-known tribe in uh, the, mostly in Tanzania and um, Kenya, Kenya. So um, we're, we're somewhat aware that there's a lot of tourism that goes into these villages. And so we, we know them and these are called uh, uh, Maasai warriors. And uh, there's a lot of myth that goes on, but they live in these uh, way out and they're herding their cattle also. And they're semi-nomadic in moving the cattle around where there are better places to feed them. And they literally build these bomas where everybody lives almost not quite, but almost communally in these bomas. And they also keep the cattle in these places too. And this is a uh, Maasai warrior. And, uh, um, but you can see here, 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 here's, here's, uh, them in a school. A, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the schools in certain countries that we've been to use uniforms. It's a very important uh, equalizing component. And, and this is one of the high schools that we photographed in Tanzania, in 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 near the uh, Maasai part of the country. And I'm gonna go back and. See. Uh, I just screwed that up. Sorry, I didn't. I was trying to go back here. Let's see. All right. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, feel free to unmute and ask or type into the please, chat. Please, please, please. Yeah, I do. Yes. Hi, Lou. So I was the uh, the photographer for a zoo, and we brought over some Maasai because of uh, animals. They came over to to bless the animals that we were going to be husbanding and then send back the. This was the, in Africa, though. No, they came to California. Oh, we, we actually cool. flew them. So a Maasai warrior, uh, a few of them, and so I was tasked with uh, uh, giving a tour of the zoo to a Maasai warrior and his wife. She was absolutely appalled at at the idea of a city. The whole the whole idea. Oh, really? Of California, <laughs> just. She was it was horribly distressed and appalled at the idea that all these people are living so close together. Um, she she felt the same way about about the I forget which major airport they flew out of, but the whole thing was just terrible. And she liked our zoo, thank God. But um, and and you know she had already had a conversation with the zookeepers and all that, so she understood exactly what was going on. I was just showing her some of the other animals, um, but. But the gentleman had quite, he found out I was a photographer and he wanted to understand why most photographers photograph the Maasai and other tribes as though they were primitive, as though right. they were, as though there was something wrong with the way they were living and they needed to be brought into the 21st century. And, and he felt that that was a, a, a horrible uh, thing because they had chosen, this is who they are, this is, this is what they are, 
This is how they live, and they just don't, the ones who have enough food don't see enough, see anything wrong with it. If you have enough food and you have enough water, you, you, you should, in other words, basically, they told the rest of us to just fuck off and 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 leave them alone. Um, and but if they we would like to bring our money and our cameras, they were fine with that. But they they he he kind of didn't like the way that most people photograph them as though there was something wrong. Well, that is a, a tremendous, and that was yes, you are you have hit it. Hit, hit the nail on the head. We have taught that these tribal situations are primitive. Whereas, as you said, he and his people are trying to preserve these ways of life against even pressure, not only from the general population that might be looking with shirts and ties like we have, but also against the government that is also, now I'm gonna get political here. I, I was promising myself I wouldn't get too, too political, but in point of fact, where you're seeing the Maasai, they are like our Native Americans being pushed off of their lands because they have this lifestyle that is in fact more spread out, is not compacted, living together, living in ways that they've lived for, 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 for generations. But the majority populations are trying to push them off of these lands for a number of reasons. One is because they consider them backward. Two, they're not getting taxes from them. And three, these properties, these lands are often also populated by the animals, the elephants, the lions, the hyenas, the, the rhinoceroses, et cetera. Rhinoceroses, is that a word? Rhinoceri, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, Rhinos. Right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> anyway, being populated, and that is a huge source of revenue for tourism. So they want to promote the tourism, make it bigger. And so your point is, yes, he, his consternation is well-founded. And uh, one of the cutest things about being amongst the Maasai in Tanzania and Kenya is that even though they are living in these huts, these bomas, these straw uh, houses, these amazing uh, compounds, communal compounds, et cetera. No, no running water, no electricity, no media. They all have cell phones. And it is one of the most amazing phenomena to see somebody literally standing on one leg because they often do that talking on a cell phone to somebody, but cell phones talking about the technology, how, fa how far they have pushed technology way beyond anything we're doing in this country. You can, with a cell phone in many countries, you can, you can buy a car, you can, you can pay your employees using a cell phone, you can do your banking, you can find the best prices for your agricultural products where they have been for centuries locked into one person who might be exploiting them and giving them look. Now you can use the, you can find out uh, weather situations for planting. You can find out best situations using a cell phone. We donated uh, an, enough solar power char uh, What's really funny is the solar power telephone chargers came from um, a company that supports preppers here in the United States. Preppers? Preppers, you know, the, the doomsday preppers, the ones who are preparing oh. for the end of the world, oh. <laughs> those guys. So at Patriot is the name of it also. I mean, these are like the far, far right hand, but they make really good uh, uh, <laughs> cell phone chargers. So we donated enough for everyone in the village because you can recharge a phone a hell of a lot easier 
than a laptop or a computer or you just this thing's out in the sunshine and it charges your phone i mean it's just i have two well they they're 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 young they're young people yeah. are miles ahead of ours in terms of, i'd mentioned uh, uh, video games but they're able to do things with a phone as individuals because they're hacking they're reprogramming they're using these devices both their computer and their cell phone and that has become and not only that but the biggest advances in technology companies and startups have been around cell phone technology in banking so there are these enormous banking systems um and uh, as a matter of fact i tried to get into one in uh, zambia zambia i didn't have any luck i got into i got at the edge of the bank but i you know and i wanted to publicize show people how banking is being done in uh, in uh, you know, but the technology, but you're absolutely right. And to take your message, please take your message about this concept of people saying primitive as being, it's just, it's just- He, a, he, he, he objected you know. to the thought that we, that the majority of Americans think that they're unhappy. No. That's right, that's the right. The ones that have enough food and water are not unhappy at all. They're perfectly happy with their lives. And they see, and it's not that they don't know because they have the phones, they see the technology, they see the cities and go, screw that. It's not that much, I now live in Arizona. We have people here who are not dissimilar. Uh, we have, first of all, uh, we're surrounded by, by uh, Indian land here. I, I cut through Indian land uh, to get to Walmart. Uh, so no, I, but, but it's really funny because they have like a 25 mile an hour speed limit. So people avoid that road because it's just like, and they, it's a speed trap, but the, there's a lot of people here in Arizona who want to live out in the middle of nowhere. They don't want to be bothered. They have solar power. They have a well, leave them alone. They're happy. And, and he feels the same way. Just leave them alone. They're happy. But if you do want to come and take pictures, you can leave your money there. They're fine. <laughs> yeah, I want to go to, over to Elizabeth's had her hand up yes, for a while. Yes. How are you doing, Elizabeth? Hi. Um, Jesus, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> um, I've had the good fortune of traveling to Africa to over 13 countries many, 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 many times, thank thankfully. Um, and when I travel, I usually spend at least a good three weeks um, so I can travel around, get to know the people, and then that makes me go back again and again. Um, you know, the idea of westernizing the entire world to me is just sickening. And I've spent many times, you know, three weeks with the Southern Omo tribes in Ethiopia, with the Maasai tribe, I was just there in January. Um, and they have a beautiful relationship with the wildlife, so much so that I had a, a Zoom, you know, I made one of my big Zoom lenses and that Maasai was right next to my elephant. And I said, listen, I can only shoot that eyeball with my camera, with the lens that I have on. I need you to back up. He goes, you're not afraid. Don't worry. They're, you know, they're not going to do anything. We have a great relationship with the elephants. I said, I believe you, but I just can't photograph anything, <laughs> maybe the few hairs. So. Um, you know, we have all these different myths, you know, about um, what is right and what we should impose as Westerners upon these people. And um, uh, the reason I've been back 13 times and I plan to go back again, and my daughter's been living there for the last five and a half years, um, is because there is this uniqueness about Africa and there's this beauty and there's this vibration that is like nowhere else in the world. And unfortunately, uh, you know, while, and I'm not gonna, this isn't a political statement, it's a fact, while the US has turned its back on the rest of the world and focused solely on uh, their interests, um, China has been taking over Africa, the entire continent. You could be in the most remote place and you will see a, a mind cover where there shouldn't be anything there. Um, and you can go to Ghana and everything is in Chinese. Uh, and it's like that in many parts. So, I mean, it's a very complicated issue, but the idea 
to westernize and to tell these people not to put their lip plates in or not to do scarification or not to have their religious ceremonies is just, um, I wish we could, you know, the US is so young that we don't have any kind of history like that, but the only ones that do are the Native Americans and they were the right ones that had the relationship with the land. And, you know, Arizona next year, Colorado, where I am now, we're not giving you any more water because, um, you know, it's this relationship that we have to have with uh, nature, with humans, with fellow humans, and a respect that should go across the board and, and not try to impose our beliefs and the way we grew up on other people. It's just, sorry for the rant, but it's just, uh, let's you know respect different cultures. And if he wants to be left alone and if we wanna drop money, okay, that's our choice, but you know, let's not impose our, our beliefs on people. Thank Michael. you. Thank you. Michael came in late. Yes. Where's Michael? Hi. I have a question. You know that there's there's um, there's, there's a large area in Brooklyn, New York, Brooklyn, New York, where everything is in uh, Russian. There's a large area in um, in the Bronx where everything is in Spanish. Um, there's a large area in Pennsylvania where everything is in German. It's where people have emigrated to. I, I don't I don't find anything wrong with China going into areas of Africa. The benefit of land, the people, and the, the, the animals. I was in Africa for a month, many, many decades ago, um, on safari for um, 27 days. And I was in Tanzania during the reign of Idi Amin. Uh, who was the dictator of Tanzania. And as scary as it was to be in that country during that, that, uh, that person's uh, uh, reign, uh, the, the people themselves, the land and the animals uh, that I saw have been burnt into my brain forever. I mean, um, it was, it was, and, and then, and, and then to, to end that part of it, and then I, I got back on board. Uh, uh, I, even though I was working for Pan Am, uh, I did the trip on TWA, but I stayed at all the Pan Am hotels, which were the intercontinental hotel system. Uh, but I stayed. I was in the bush. I was in, I was in tents and stuff like that. But when I flew back home and we landed at uh, JFK and I got into a taxi cab, uh, the first bit of news I got from 1010 Winds was uh, some, some guy jumped off the Empire State Building, fell down and landed on, a, on the roof of the second tier down and lived. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm back in America. Um, That's right. It was probably the most relaxing time that I had um, in Africa. Um, um, I mean, you have to get used to some of the food. I mean, uh, I had a hamburger that was made out of uh, um, canoe, wildebeest. <laughs> it was delicious. And you, you, you go to sleep at night or wake up in the morning and go out on your, uh, your little wooden patio by the tent and you can see the elephants, you know, drinking from uh, the water or other animals licking the salt, uh, the, the salt, uh, I don't know what they're called now, the, uh, the salt things. Um, and they're no more than maybe 50 yards away from you. Um, I was in a place called Ngorogoro Crater. 
right. which was a volcano that imploded instead of exploding. And it's 12 miles long and 10 miles wide. And normally when, when animals uh, do their yearly migrations, uh, you know, you see large herds of whatever migrating. In Gorongoro Crater, none of the animals migrate. There's no need to. The, the temperature is always the same. The British government decided to start counting how many flamingos were in the lake decades ago. When they got to two million, they stopped because it was it was it was still there was still a lot more than the two million that they had already counted. It's beautiful. Oh, it's it's by and large an untapped continent. Um, I, I think a lot of countries are trying to get into Africa because there's a lot of precious minerals uh, that they're looking to mine in order to uh, uh, help develop the next generation of technology. Um, and then of course you get you know the ugly Americans like uh, Trump's kids that will go in there and um, and uh, shoot uh, elephants and rhinoceros and, and lions and for the sake of, of um, putting it on their mantle, which is outrageous, absolutely outrageous. Hey, Mike, uh, Idi Amin was the dictator of Uganda. Uganda. And yeah. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I was, I was in three countries. I was in, I was in Kenya, <laughs> Tanzania, and Uganda. And when we got right. into Uganda, I, it was, was bizarre, but the people were incredible. So I'm sorry. I'm old. It's okay. I make, and, all, and the Chinese old, already, I make a and the Chinese already <laughs> got all the mines. So yeah, unfortunately, anyway, let's the Chinese go back got to all Lou. the mines. I can't hear two of you at the same time. No, Elizabeth, saying, what did you say? Let's... Elizabeth. It's okay. We can go, we can go back to Lou. Yeah, let's go back to Lou's presentation. If you, do okay. you need to share again, Lou? No, no, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to use, um, uh, uh, well, let's, let's bounce off. I, I was trying to not get too, too political. We talk about China. Um, the China's presence in Africa is uh, increasing and is tremendous now. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why um, Africa has resources that are unfound anywhere else in the world. They're, I photograph copper mines and they're supplying some of the, uh, the world's, the biggest parts of copper. I went up in Morocco is, is phosphate and they're I think the second largest supplier of phosphate. And so we're chasing and then um, the Chinese are also uh, doing, um, uh, agriculture, they're, they're buying up huge tracts of land and building tremendous infrastructure in Africa. They're building roads and dams and buildings and communities, et cetera, et cetera. It's a complex issue. It's a complex political issue. And uh, they are increasing their investment in Africa. And the United States is decreasing its investment there. So uh, we're having this, you know, and, and yet we are talking about the terrible methods that China is using with their resources, with their money, et cetera. And it's, it's really a very complex issue. We have to be very, very careful about being so um, xenophobic, not only toward only toward the Africans, but also toward the Chinese, in terms of how uh, I'm not crazy about a lot of what they're doing either. Um, but there is a tremendous amount of investment there is, and so we have to be much more cognizant of how our approach to Africa is something that we have to pay more and more and more attention to. So I'll get off my soapbox there, and uh, I've got another another uh, client appointment at three, so uh, okay. I can only go a little while longer. 
Well, well, it's good to hear that you're busy and working too. Yes, yes. We're, we, you know, things have gotten a little, but the one thing I will ask people, there is a book for sale. I would love anybody to look in and maybe buy the book, but also if you have resources in Africa, if you have friends, if you have investments, if you have connections in Africa, please get in touch with me. Um, that's how this thing is done. It's, we have had to resist using, um, we almost do no American connections to anything going on in Africa. I'm not gonna say none, but we, we have resisted NGOs and F, uh, FBOs and uh, all of that kind of thing because they all have an agenda, all have an American agenda, all have a Western agenda. So we almost, only deal with people in country on ground and who have a stake in what's going on there all of almost all of our research is done that way so if you have connections to any of those kinds of resources please get in touch with me and uh, that's how six degrees of separation that's how this whole project's been done so please please and i'll, I'll uh, i hopefully we have uh, talk to a lot of people and um, and people get a different view view of a little bit different view of Africa as we go forward. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking about this project. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Sure. Anyone else have some last minute questions or yes. any comments yes. they want? Now, it looks like we're good. I'm going to stop the Facebook share here. There you go and say thank you and stop the recording so thank, thank you, you all Lou. for joining us today thank you so much everybody appreciate it thank you Lou. Lou, it thank you good work thank you <laughs> you do good work i appreciate it